Raj also set a bit of a record when they launched uh, their in-house made Torbion and they uh, they had a fantastic result with uh, the first two editions. The first one, um, uh, Torbion 1, and the second one was the Lensman 1. Uh, both, for both, you sold something like over 200 pieces, uh, Dave, and it was a manufactured Torbion at a price level of, you know, between the first and the second one, seven, 8,000, depending on whether you were an early bird subscriber or not. Uh, Johnny, that was that was impressive. When I was uh, tripping over myself at the start and I'm using the expression about uh, being a, a disruptive brand, that's exactly what I had in mind there. Uh, the the Turbion is, uh, over the last 20 years, since it's, it's risen back into uh, popularity and it's been a feature mostly with... Uh, you know, very old or luxury pieces. And then over time, it has been found in pieces like a uh, tag, even created uh, a tourbillon at, at about 15,000, I believe it was back at the time. Horage came in and, and even blew that out of the water, uh, coming in at nearly. I remember half. when Jeja Lecoultre, uh, I think it was 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, launched first tourbillon in steel at 40,000 Swiss francs and nobody could believe it, uh, believe it then. So yeah, sorry, carry on, Johnny. So that, but that's, that's the definition of being disruptive, that they've come in, uh, they've come in under the radar and uh, are just popped up with this uh, extraordinary uh, tourbillon that is actually manufactured in house and includes some very high tech uh, innovation as well with the use of silicone in the regulating organ, and uh, so not only is it, uh, do, like there are, don't get me wrong, there are they, there are other ways to do it. They could have gone and got a uh, imported, let us say, uh, uh, movement and uh, or or the components, but no, they have very very single mindedly set out to do everything on their own, or as much as it be damned as is possible yeah. to do. And, yeah, and a lot a lot of that came around through necessity as much as anything you know um many people in the watch industry will tell you it, it quite often is a fool's errand to decide i want to make an in-house movement from the ground up um it's it's a labor of love as opposed to a commercially sensitive sensible decision to make let's put it like that you know there's lots of extremely good off-the-shelf movements that can be had for the watch industry mm. let's not um belittle that fact but sometimes having access to certain movements certain technologies certain materials is not the easiest thing in the world because sometimes those are exclusive to given brands or they are only allowed to be given to x number of people and our tourbillon project really did start uh, probably in a slightly more traditional uh, method which was i guess co-developing a tourbillon movement with one of the uh, big swiss kind of movement manufacturers mm-hmm. and trying That's to come brilliant. up with absolutely and trying to come up with something Um, And then through a combination of circumstances, time, really nothing of any fault of our own, um, change of ownership, change of people at the top, change of kind of mindsets, they decided to discontinue that relationship and discontinue that project. So really by that stage it was, well, either it goes in the bin and we've wasted quite a lot of people's time and effort and work, or do we pick up the baton and keep running? It's a bit like in the middle of a relay race, if someone drops a bat and you instinctively think you've lost, but if you don't pick it up and keep running, you never know, you might win. And, you know, we attacked it head on and we attacked it with a very competent group of young engineers, as you mentioned, Pietro. And in pretty much a record-breaking time, we believe, uh, we managed to bring a product to market that is not only quite innovative and typically seen as difficult to do, but is coming in at a very, very... Um, aggressive price point and is a stable and kind of maturing platform. This one you see here is using the Tourbillon that was first launched in the, funnily enough, the Tourbillon 1 model, which uh, I think there was in and around 250, 260 units of these ones we ended up um, selling. It was only open for a given period of time. And what we said was, however many people order within that window, we, we will get one of these watches. So that's what we did with that. Um, and we learned a lot. And there was a couple of kind of iterative design process updates, etc. went along the roads with this one. Um, but 
That's culminated in us launching quite recently, just at the end of last year, the second generation of, uh, or I say second generation, but the second model of Tour Beyond Watch, which is the Lensman 1, effectively using the same movement. And we have a Lensman 1.1, which is about to launch for the people that missed out on the Lensman 1, uh, that will be, that was just announced a couple of days ago, the one you're showing on the screen here. That's the one with the red uh, indices on there as well. So it's got a red loom fill indice, which is slightly different from the original Lensman 1, which was a kind of all black dial. The big thing about this watch is it's got a bit of a photography theme in terms of the design around the kind of edge of the bezel and the edge of the case. And you also have a Cyclops uh, magnifier over the cutout in the dial for the tourbillon cage. So you get that little bit of additional magnification being shown on there as well. So yeah, you can see again here this kind of ethymology that is uh, built into it. So you've got a crown that resembles a little bit like that traditional pusher or shutter button on your camera. And you've got these markings that are kind of reminiscent of people. So it's got that theme and kind of uh, design language from photography. But that's not to say you need to be a photographer to love this watch if you like the look of it. Um, you know, it's not as niche as people think it is. A lot of people sometimes think when you take muse from something for a watch that it's narrowing its, uh, its kind of appeal. But there's plenty of watches out there with very bizarre, you know, uh, bezels, whether you're tachymeters or your pulsometers. I don't think most people use those in their day-to-day -day life either. Okay. I, I think it's a very, uh, with Horage and the Lensman series, it's a very consistent theme. And what we're about to look at over the next 15, 20 minutes or so uh, is how th that uh, theme has been expanded and further integrated into the design uh, language of, of the new pieces in particular. But uh, yeah. it, it, it's still, as I say, it's consistent and it's not a gimmick. There is an actual... Uh, so there is a strong connection with Orage, with Landon and photography. And he's clearly uh, uh, very, very into his photography. Uh, we'll, we'll even look at some of the images that have been created by Brian Griffin, who is uh, behind one of the editions that we're going to be looking at shortly. But it is, it, this yeah, the Turbion one, it's uh, the 1.1 1 .1, uh, lens man is. Uh, it's a, a, Pietro, my thinking, it's a hell of a lot of watch. Absolutely. Absolutely.